to. Um, so remember where we were. We did coordinate ascent variational inference, where we, I'll get back to it, it's right here, where we um, iteratively march through each data point, updating its local variational parameter, and then we aggregate those local variational parameters and update the global variational parameter. By the way, something I forgot to mention yesterday is that this little structure here, alpha plus a sum of these, of these um, functions, that is the, for those of you familiar with the relationship between like the Dirichlet and the multinomial or the beta and the Bernoulli or the Dirichlet and the, uh, sorry, the gamma and the Poisson, this is the general exponential family form of that relationship. Okay, so you can turn your knowledge of those um, pairs of co conjugate pairs, prior likelihood into uh, a, a equation that looks like this. Anyway, this is where we left off, coordinate descent variational inference. And we talked about how it's inefficient because like I said, with topic modeling, you initialize your topics randomly. They have no meaning at all. And then you painstakingly analyze each document, understanding, let me go back to the algorithm, under, in this step, understanding how each document relates to your randomly generated topics. And when you have millions of documents, that is a uh, non-starter. So we're gonna get to this structure where we iteratively subsample some data, look at how it reflects the global hidden structure, and then update the global hidden structure just with that subset and repeat. Okay, and this is gonna be much more efficient. Okay, then we applauded Herb Robbins for all of his accomplishments. And remember now the drunk people, the trying to get from Cape, from uh, Stellenbosch to Johannesburg and everybody's drunk, that's stochastic optimization. Okay, so, you know, in the morning, you can't talk about drunk people. So um, mathematically, what stochastic optimization looks like is this. Remember, the idea is that we're following noisy gradients. When you ask a drunk person how to get to Johannesburg, that's a noisy gradient. And so the noisy gradient is denoted with this little hat gradient, okay? So this is like the noisy gradient of the objective function at some parameter value nu, all right? And stochastic optimization does is simply follow noisy realizations of the gradient. We set the next parameter value equal to the current parameter value plus some step size rho t times a noisy realization of the gradient evaluated at the current parameter value. And when does this work? Well, there are two requirements. One is that the gradients are unbiased. Okay, so if you're not familiar with what that means, what that means is that the expectation of the noisy gradient equals the true gradient, okay? And in the drunk person's story, that's where we magically revive the person who showed us the way to Johannesburg, and if we ask them on, over and over again how to get to Johannesburg, on average, they point right at Johannesburg. Okay, that is the notion of an unbiased noisy gradient. Which way they point is an unbiased noisy gradient if the expectation of which way they point is equal to the true gradient. The second condition is that the step size sequence, rho t, follows what are called the robin Monroe conditions. And what the robin Monroe conditions, uh, do I have them here? I don't think I do. What the robin Monroe conditions are simply is that, the, so the step size is how how far I walk after I ask a person how to get to Johannesburg, that's row T. And the Robinson row conditions specify how that has to decrease for this algorithm to converge. <clears throat> and in particular, what you need is that the sum of the row T's diverges. Okay, so the sum of the row T's from T equals one to infinity has to equal infinity but the sum of the squares of the rho t's converges, okay? The sum of the squares of rho t has to be less than infinity. And intuitively, this is saying that I need to, need to walk fewer and fewer steps each time because as I get closer to Johannesburg, I, I don't wanna overshoot when I ask, you know, an unreliable source how to get there. But I want to eventually be able to get anywhere even though they, even though, uh, they get smaller and smaller. So, the sum of the squares being uh, converging, being less than infinity, that tells me that it gets small enough, fast enough, but the sum of the rho t's being diverging, equaling infinity, means I can get anywhere eventually. Yeah, that's the idea. <coughs> For example, one over t satisfies this. Now, 
stochastic optimization in 1951 was one thing, it's a whole field now, and um, you know, probably some of you have heard of things like Adagrad and RMS prop. These are ways to adaptively set the step size, not necessarily following the Robinson row conditions, but it does well. I'm sorry, what? Oh, so, okay. Um, interrupt me with questions, but if I hear ghost questions, I apologize. Um, okay, so we want to use this idea, stochastic optimization, which again drives machine learning at all these companies. We want to use it to do variational inference. So the next idea is the idea of the natural gradient of the elbow, okay? And um, so this is not a noisy gradient. This is an actual a full gradient. It's called the natural gradient. And the natural gradient of the elbow looks like this. It is, this is the natural gradient of the elbow with respect to the global variational parameter. And what it is, is it's the hyperparameter alpha plus a sum of these expected functions of the local parameter, of the, sorry, of the local hidden variable and the data point, um, minus the current value of the global latent variable, of the global variational parameter. Okay, so this might be for like a topic, for instance. And um, let me unpack this a little bit for you. What this is saying is that if I calculate the coordinate update for the global variational parameter and subtract the current value of the global variational parameter, then that gives me a valid direction that I can walk in to increase the elbow. Okay, that's what this is saying. This is a valid type of gradient. And what a natural gradient is more specifically has to do with information geometry. I think just in, for the interest of time, I'm gonna skip describing what a natural gradient is, but if you're interested, ask at the end and I'll explain what a natural gradient is. But for now, just think of it as a convenient type of gradient. It's a gradient that respects the special structure when you're optimizing parameters to probability distributions, which of course a variational parameter is. Okay, so that's a natural gradient. We like it not because it's got all these special properties, but because it's got this convenient form in this case. For the, for the, for the elbow, the natural gradient has this nice form. And the usual Euclidean gradient does not. So what we're gonna do is use the natural gradient and we're gonna construct a noisy natural gradient. All right, and the way we're gonna do it is as follows. We're gonna choose a random data point J from our data set. Okay, so we're gonna grab an index J uniformly from one to N. And then I'm going to calculate alpha plus N, the number of data, times the expectation of T of Z, J, X, J minus lambda. All right, so I'm going to, in other words, operationally, I'm gonna pluck a data point I'm gonna calculate its local variational parameter. I'm gonna calculate this little term I need for that as part of the, the um, global variational parameter coordinate update. But instead of doing this for each data point, I'm gonna do it just for that one data point and multiply it by n, all right? And then subtract off my current realization of the global variational parameter. So convince yourself by staring at this that this this is a noisy gradient because it um, involves a random variable J and it has the properties that we need for stochastic optimization. In particular, one, its expectation is equal to the exact gradient, right? If I take the expectation of this with respect to the randomly chosen data point, I get back the equation on top. You see that? Two, it's cheap, all right? So you need two things really. You need that it's unbiased for the theory to work. But for stochastic optimization to be something you want to do in the first place, you want these noisy realizations of the gradient to be cheaper than the true gradient, the exact gradient. And this is indeed cheaper because it only depends on the optimized parameters of one data point. So whereas in the first, calculating this gradient requires going through all the data, here calculating this gradient only requires looking at one data point and, um, and fitting its local variational parameters. Okay, and so that's the, that's the procedure. So here is stochastic. We're gonna start with, we have a data set X, and some model, which is just a joint distribution, P of beta, Z, and X. Nico. So 
th this is the simplest for notation on the slides, but in practice you might grab a handful of data points and then adjust this n accordingly, right? This becomes n divided by the batch size. Yeah. Okay, so we start with a data set x and a um, joint p of beta z and x, and we're going to initialize our global variational parameters randomly, like garbage topics, and we're going to set our step sizes appropriately, okay, so that it satisfies the Robin Monroe conditions. Then we're going to cycle, okay, so uh, we're always going to be looking for convergence. Usually we use a holdout set and look at the predictive log probability of the holdout set to check for convergence, but you could also just look at the parameters themselves to see if their norm has gone, gone small enough. Um, and the first thing we're going to do is grab this data point and calculate its local variational parameter. So we grab a data point or a mini batch, and we set its local parameter to the expectation of uh, its, uh, its it, and we set its local parameter to its optimal. Okay, right? We, we saw this in the coordinate wise variational update. Then we set what we call an intermediate global parameter, which basically looks like pretending that this was the only data point we saw, what would the optimal global parameter be? And then we set the next global parameter to be a, weight, a weighted average of this intermediate global parameter and our previous value of the global parameter. This should say, this, these should have t's on them, like t, t, this is t plus one equals one minus rho t lambda t plus rho t lambda hat, okay? And so, this is basically following that noisy, nat following that natural gradient. So if you stare at this algorithm, you can see a couple things different from the coordinate update algorithm. One, mainly, is that rather than doing something for every data point in this step, we only need to do something for one data point. And yet we then immediately make progress in the global variational parameter. Okay, and so this has that promise structure, subsample the data, understand how that subsample uh, reflects the global hidden structure, update the global hidden structure, and repeat. Okay, just to go back to the algorithm, subsample the data, and understand how that, how the data reflects the global structure, then update the global structure and repeat. Okay, so in LDA, just to go back to this example, we sample a document, we ask how does this document reflect the current idea of the topics, we then form intermediate topics, and then update the topics, okay? And so now, this is the picture that shows us why, it shows us that this is a good idea. So what I'm plotting here, <coughs> this is from the paper where we developed this algorithm. What I'm plotting here is, um, so we're gonna run LDA, and we're using Wikipedia as our document collection, okay? So Wikipedia, at that point, had like three and a half million articles. Now, in the x-axis is how many documents I have to process as part of the algorithm. And in the y-axis is perplexity, which relates to held out log likelihood. It's basically an assessment of model fitness and generalization performance. Okay, so lower numbers are better for perplexity, and um, this measures how good the model is at capturing the distribution of language. Now, at that time in 2010, with coordinate ascent variational inference, the, the corpus size we could handle was about 100,000 documents. All right, so batch 98K represents running coordinate variational inference with LDA, the 2003 algorithm, um, with, this cor with a corpus of 100,000 Wikipedia articles. And what we're plotting here is at each iteration what the perplexity is. Okay, so you can see, again, the, uh, the x-axis is on the log scale. So in coordinate descent variational inference, remember we start with topics and then we analyze every document according to those topics and then update the topics. And so here we start coordinate descent variational inference. We analyze all 100,000 topics. That gets us to the 10 to the fifth point in the x-axis. And then we update the topics and we get our first assessment of held out perplexity right there. Then we analyze 100,000 documents again and we get here, 100,000 documents again and we get here and so on, okay? and you can see it's converging, right? That's the classical algorithm. But now with stochastic variational inference, we repeatedly sample just a few documents, let's say 10, analyze them and update the topics. And so we can immediately, after just seeing a few documents, um, 
get an assessment of held out predictive log of, of held out perplexity. And this line, the blue line on line 98K, that's using the same corpus of 100,000 articles, but I'll get to it. Um, but, uh, but running stochastic variational inference. And what you can see is, first of all, we immediately get an assessment of held out perplexity. And after roughly doing as much computation as we did with the classical algorithm, we're already in a much better place than the classical algorithm is at the same level of computation. Okay, so it's converging much faster, and it indeed actually converges to a better spot. But of course, the reason we developed stochastic variational inference was not to analyze the same data set, but was to analyze bigger data sets that we can't handle with batch algorithms, with the classical algorithm. And so that's what online 3.3 million is. This is the full data set of Wikipedia. In fact, Matt Hoffman's code for this, what it did was just randomly, like Wikipedia has an API, you can get a random article from Wikipedia. He just kept calling that. That's how he sampled a Wikipedia article. So he kept calling that, got the article, and up added it to its to the LDA model and kept repeating that and and we we can again fit LDA to this larger data set. You had a question? Yeah, that's true. There's no magic bean that lets you get all the global, all the local parameters without going through all your data. Okay. Unless, yeah, I guess you could time travel. Yeah, but um, without that, you can't, you can't do that. So, so, so yes, um, what this saves us though is to get to that point, right? To get to that fitted model. Let's say your application is something where you do want the, say the topic proportions for every article. At some point you have to pay the, and march through your articles and calculate the topic proportions. But the advantage here is that you only have to do that at the end, once you've converged. And it's the, the updates to the global parameters is the bottleneck. Right, so that's a good point. Um, right, why do we use a holdout set to decide whether or not we've converged? Well, I guess in, in theory, you could use a subset of the training set but the issue is that if you're gonna use the, tr so in classical variational inference, we might use the elbow itself, right? We might just calculate the elbow on the data to find out if it converged because we're optimizing the elbow. That's a natural thing to check. But here, <coughs> you know, the whole point is that the data set's too big to do that. So what are you gonna do? So we used held out log likelihood. Um, that said, you know, we were fair. We used held out log likelihood here too, and we're plotting held out log likelihood. Yeah, so no, we don't find overfitting as a problem. You can see that here. Although overfitting often with topic models is about relative decay rather than relative to iterations of the fitting algorithm. Other questions? Yeah. Is there a reason you start with the topic and the local parameter and then do the global parameter and not start with the, like does that automatically? Well, you, there's no alternative. So, you know, you, we, it, we start the global parameters randomly, but we cannot change them unless we know any, something about a document. But what do we need to know about the document to change the global parameters? It's local parameter. Yep. Yeah. Um, so when you, when you decide when I'm going to convert, you get this new thing. Yeah, so that's part of the kind of pra uh, question about the practical realities of these types of algorithms. And um, so in like the classical setting, there's lots of ways to initialize variational inference with the documents themselves, running k-means, or just randomly choosing topics. What we did here was truly randomly, right? Like I said, the, the code just queries the Wikipedia API for a random Wikipedia document. So the way we start it is by just drawing from a sparse gamma distribution to get these, po these variational Dirichlet parameters. Yeah, so it's, it's truly random. That said, I, I keep mentioning this and, you know, an unsolved problem in variational inference is how to robustly initialize these variational parameters to do that. What's a good rule of thumb that can work across many, many models? Uh, we don't have that. Good. Okay. Da, da, da. So this is the idea. And, and you can see why so this really changed what we could do with variational inference from having to use small data sets to being able to now handle large data sets. But it's really just mirroring the machine learning revolution that Robin's idea enables.
which is that we can now run all kinds of machine learning algorithms on large data sets thanks to stochastic gradient updates. Okay, this is how we get this picture, right? With the science article, that it was 17,000 articles, it was very small. But to analyze 1.8 million articles from the New York Times, we need stochastic variational inference. This is how we can get these topics. And this is how we've done many of the models that I showed you in the beginning of the talk, like community detection with millions of nodes. Population analysis with billions of genetic measurements. And as I mentioned, we did this now, we, I derived this for you for this whole class of conditionally conjugate models, and that, and that encompasses many, many models from machine learning from the 90s and 2000s and beyond. So with stochastic variational inference, you can now scale up variational inference in all of these models just by using that recipe. Okay, so that's what I wanted to say about stochastic variational inference and introducing the idea of variational inference. The next idea I want to talk about um, is black box variational inference. <coughs> so again, this picture, we'll see it again too. Variational inference solves the inference problem by casting it as an optimization problem. And the idea is we posit a variational family of distributions of the latent variables, and then we fit the variational parameters nu to be close in KL divergence to the exact posterior. Now, in 2002 and 2001 and 2003 and so on, this is how we derived variational inference algorithms, okay? So this is an appendix from um, my paper about LDA. And the appendix, basically, you know, we wrote down the variational objective in the main paper, and the appendix goes through this difficult process of deriving the gradients with respect to each variational parameter, sometimes using Lagrange multipliers because they had to sum to one, and deriving the coordinate updates that I showed you in the beginning. Okay, and this is an appendix, but this, these two columns really represent like multiple years of my life in grad school, okay, taking derivatives, implementing them, finding a bug either in the implementation or in the derivative itself, not knowing where that bug is, repeating over and over again. But it was happy days actually. Um, so and this is a problem, this is a block, right? If, if every time you come up with a new model you need to write a big appendix to your paper, then it um, slows you down from being able to try out lots and lots of models. And so the vision for black box variational inference is for there to be no more appendices. We want to easily use variational inference with any model and then still be able to do inference with massive data, but again, no mathematical work beyond specifying the model, okay? I, I want to be able to just write down LDA and not have to do this. Okay, and so, you know, here's a little schematic for what we want. We want any model to go into this picture we want to be able to reuse variational families. We want to be able to handle massive data, and we want our box to produce for us approximate posteriors through the, through the approximate variational posteriors. Now, this means going beyond conditionally conjugate models, and many, many models go beyond conditionally conjugate models. So I have a nice list of conditionally conjugate models that many, many models are in. Um, but Things like models with attention, deep latent Gaussian models, nonlinear time series models, many generalized linear models. The simplest one, frankly, is logistic regression. So logistic regression, Bayesian logistic regression is not in the conditionally conjugate family. Um, sigmoid belief networks, variants of topic models that don't use Dirichlet's, deep exponential families, which we'll get to, and so on. There are many models that don't have this nice um, property that you can write down all the complete conditionals and uh, we're kind of stuck how to do variational inference in those models. Okay, so just so we have, again, a concrete model that we're talking about, I want to talk about deep exponential families briefly. <clears throat> again, this is in the spirit of separating model from inference, so we're now going to talk about a different model. Um, and deep exponential families are part of the field of Bayesian deep learning. Okay, so um, what's Bayesian deep learning? Well, first of all, what's deep learning? One way to summarize deep learning is that it's about discovering layered representations of high dimensional data. 
right? My favorite paper about deep learning is this review paper from Yoshua Bengio and others from 2013. I think it's called Representation Learning, a Review in New Perspectives. And it's a really nice paper about, well, it's, this is a summary of the paper, about how deep learning is about these layered representations. Bayesian statistics. So what is Bayesian statistics? Bayesian statistics is about casting all inferences about unknown quantities as probability calculations. All right, so <clears throat> if you're doing Bayesian statistics, then you're gonna want a posterior distribution of a hidden variable given observations because since you're doing Bayesian statistics, that's how you cast the problem of understanding what an unknown quantity is, okay? And um, my favorite book about Bayesian statistics is this one, Gelman et al. Um, from 2014, that's the third edition, uh, called Bayesian Data Analysis. It's a great book. So what is Bayesian deep learning? Well, Bayesian deep learning, one way to think about it, is as using posterior inference to obtain inferences about layered representations of high dimensional data. All right, in other words, let's take the deep learning idea, but let's replace everything unknown with a random variable and then look at what the resulting probability is. All right, and that's what a deep exponential family is. So this is the graphical model for a deep exponential family. It looks a little complicated, um, but let me, let me walk you through it. Okay, so <clears throat> this is again gonna be a model for some kind of high dimensional data. Um, but let's look at it from the top down. All right, we start off, um, the idea is that there's gonna be a, 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 a cascade of hidden variables that bottom out in the observation, all right? And so we start out and we draw the first set of hidden variables, Z, at the top. Um, and then the next set of hidden variables for each data point depends on the previous set of hidden variables. So z, we have Z, uh, L here and ZL minus one depends on ZL and then ZL minus two depends on ZL minus one and so on. And here somewhere we have that the next layer of Z's of hidden variables depends on the previous layer of hidden variables and the way that they depend on each other is through an exponential family distribution. So the, I'm, I'm not explaining this well. So um, each layer of hidden variables is a collection, all right? So let's say there's 10 of them. There's 10 Z's at this layer, 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 clear? Now, if you saw what I just drew, at layer two, let's look at the fifth Z, right? Z5 at layer two, it's gonna depend on all the Z's at layer one, all right? And in, in fact, all the Z's at layer two depend on all the Z's at layer one. Each Z at layer two depends on all the Z's at layer one. And in particular, the Z's at layer two, they come from an exponent, the Z at layer two comes from an exponential family whose parameter is some function of the Z's at layer one, inner product with a weight vector and put through what's called a link function. Okay, so, see if I can, so, for example, if the Z's are binary, then each Z is a Bernoulli whose parameter is some weight vector transposed with the previous layer Z's. Um, and, that's, and, uh, and that's the parameter to, it, to the Bernoulli. If Z, if the, if the hidden variables are counts, then Z might be a Poisson whose parameter is that Z who, with, um, whose parameter is, is an inner product of the previous layer of Z with some weight vector. Is this clear? So this is, or if it's a Gaussian, then you might have this Z coming from a linear regression where, the, where there are some coefficients and the covariates are the previous layer of Z's. Yeah. Nope, it can all change. If I may try like for a fifth time to explain it, it's layers of hidden variables. Each hidden variable depends on the previous layer and happens through an exponential family. Think of linear regression as the simplest example. I draw a bunch of Gaussians, then I draw a bunch of Gaussians here where each Gaussian depends on, uses the previous Gaussians as covariates and has some set of coefficients. All right, and this continues on for many layers. And then at the very bottom, the last layer, my observation, and it's some vector, and it depends on the very previous layer of hidden variables only. All right, now X depends on the top through all of these other layers, but operationally in the generative process, it only depends on the previous one. Clear? 
Okay, so as a generative process, you march through generating Zs, and then at the very end, you generate X. Yeah? Yeah, you do, right, so, so, so you're asking about the particular form of this distribution, and so this might be a Gaussian, and, but, it, but G doesn't have to be the identity, it can be some nonlinearity. Okay, all distributions are in the exponential family, and so to your question, what are the choices we have when we design these deep exponential families? We can choose the number of layers, we can choose the number of units per layer, that's how many Zs there are across, um, we can choose the type of representation. Z might be Bernoulli or Poisson or Gamma or Gaussian. And we can choose the nonlinearity, this link function G. All right, this connects to the world of generalized linear models. All right, at the bottom of the data layer, that defines the type of observations. So for example, we're going to use today, each X, it can be, each XN might be a vector of count sparse vector of counts, and XNI is the count of, say, word I in document N. I talked to someone yesterday about Poisson models of text, and this is a Poisson model of text, okay? So we might use a Poisson likelihood where XNI comes from a Poisson distribution whose rate is some nonlinear function, probably X, that of an inner product of the weights and the previous layer of hidden variables. Notice that the hidden variables are per data point, the weights are shared across you can see this in the graphical model too. All right, so here's the data plate, and, and the weights live outside the data plate, but each document comes from its own cascade of hidden variables, and then its word counts, okay? All right, so concretely, what this does is it fits a type of topic model but where there are layers of topics, and topics are described as topics of topics. Okay, so for example, um, fitting this to the New York Times, uh, this might be too blurry to see, but what we're visualizing here is, are, are the different layers of hidden variables. Okay, so, so here the third layer, um, this is the layer right before X, and these words like program, program, system, government, public, these are the words that have high probability given that that layer is somehow active. Okay, so if that Z is somehow on, or if it's a one, or if it's got a big number, then these are the words that are gonna have high probability in the resulting X vector. But this Z, of course, depends on other Zs. And when is this Z gonna be on? Well, this Z is gonna be on when this Z is on. All right, and so we kind of name these Zs as, as dividing up the, the, um, the different parts of the government right, the, the judicial, the legislative, the executive section, the political parties, and media, all right? And so, um, so this topic in, ignites these words. This topic is itself ignited when this topic is ignited. When is this topic ignited? It's ignited when this topic is ignited, okay? So we describe these topics of topics of topics of topics, finally, of words. All right, and so when you condition on a big data set, the posterior weights provide topics and topics of topics. Okay, so this idea, deep exponential families, blends deep learning and probabilistic models. You, you can see how we are representing our data as layers of hidden variables. If you're familiar with deep learning, this is like just turning the hidden units of a deep neural network into random variables. Um, like all probability models, DEFs can be composed in more complex models. Okay, so we've used them, for example, for recommendation systems and for survival analysis. Um, and there's open source software for fitting DEFs online. So that's the example model. But the question, of course, is how do we do inference? If I condition on a big data set, how do I get the hidden, how do I get posterior inferences of the Zs and of the Ws, the weights and the hidden variables? DEFs are not conditionally conjugate and black box racial inference gives us a solution. Okay, again, this is our vision, and so we want, even though diffs aren't condition, defs aren't conditionally conjugate, we want to be able to stick defs in and get variational approximations. Any last questions about defs? Okay, so let's now develop black box variational inference. So remember, here is our objective function. Variational inference optimizes the evidence lower bound. 
the lower bound on the log likelihood of the data and maximizing the elbow is equivalent to minimizing the KL. And remember, it's not convex. Now, the main idea behind black box spatial inference is going to be to use stochastic optimization again. But what we're going to do, and you saw this in Shakir's talk, is we're going to write the gradient of the elbow down as an expectation. Then we are going to sample. It's going to be an expectation with respect to Q. Then we're going to sample from Q to form Monte Carlo estimates of the gradient. And then we're going to use the Monte Carlo estimate of the gradient as a in a stochastic optimization algorithm. All right, so again, the whole point of stochastic optimization is to get noisy gradients. And um, whereas in stochastic gradational inference, we got noisy gradients by subsampling the data. Here, we're getting noisy gradients by taking Monte Carlo approximations of an expectation. We want to keep in mind when we do this what we call the black box criteria, which means that we want to only have to do the following. One, sample from Q. Two, evaluate Q or some function of Q. And three, evaluate the log joint. All right, so I only want to have to be able to do these things. I only want to have. I only want, yeah, we want to be able to do variational inference by only doing these three things. All right, and the reason we call this black box is that the idea is that if there are variational families that you want to use, you can figure out how to sample from them and figure out how to evaluate them. And then you can reuse those variational families across many, many models, right? Having to evaluate log P of beta Z and X, to me, that's equivalent to just specifying the model. Once I've specified the model, then I can evaluate the log joint. Now, there are models where we can't do that, but, but it's a huge class of models, models that we can write down. And just by writing down the model, we have evaluated the log joint, right? This is just like writing down the log probability of each part of the generative process. <clears throat> okay, so research in black box variational inference then is about how to write the gradient of this elbow down as an expectation. So I can, so I can follow that recipe, take samples from Q, Monte Carlo estimates of the gradient, follow those with stochastic optimization. And there are two main strategies, score gradients and reparameterization gradients. Okay, and Shakir called reparameterization gradients pathwise gradients, also called that. And they have many names, as Shakir told you. Okay, so let's start with the score gradient. Here's the score gradient. The gradient of the elbow with respect to the variational parameters nu equals an expectation with respect to Q of a product of two terms. The second term, I call it the instantaneous elbow. All right, it's basically the elbow evaluated at a particular value of the hidden variable z. Okay, so here now the, all the hidden variables are in z. There's no beta. It's, it's the same. Okay, so this is, I call this the instantaneous elbow. And that's multiplied by the score function. Okay, in statistics, this is called the score function. It's the gradient of the log of the density q with respect to the parameters new, right? It's somehow like how sensitive is the density at, at point new, right? So you multiply these two terms together and take the expectation with respect to Z and that is, gives you the gradient of the elbow, all right? This is also called the likelihood ratio or reinforced gradient. It's been invented multiple times through the years. And what I wanna point out to you is that this satisfies the black box criteria. Right, so to take a Monte Carlo estimate of this, I would sample from Q of Z at parameter nu, and then I would take a weighted average of the samples. So I would equally weight the samples um, of, the, of what's inside the expectation. And let's look at what this requires. One, it requires that we can sample from Q. Two, it requires that we evaluate the score function, but that's a function of the variational family. It's something we can figure out how to do and then repeat. And three, it, it requires that we can evaluate the log joint, which we said is part of the black box criteria, and that we can evaluate log Q. Okay, so hopefully you see this satisfies our criteria, that if I could do those things, I can take Monte Carlo estimates of this gradient and follow them and optimize the variational distribution. Okay, and so that's the first algorithm, score gradient black box variational inference. The input is our model and the data. 
Again, we initialize the variational parameters randomly and set our step size appropriately. And now we are again going to repeat while until convergence. The first step is to grab S samples from the variational distribution. All right, so we're gonna grab Z of S from Q of Z with parameter new. Clear? Now we're gonna use those samples to calculate a noisy score gradient. All right, so I'm basically evaluating that score gradient um, for each of those samples, right? Here I, here I evaluate the log joint, here I evaluate log Q, here I evaluate the score function, and weight those evaluations, one over S. Okay, so this is now a noisy gradient of the elbow. It's noisy because I constructed it through these, through these random samples. The expectation of this gradient is of course equal to the real gradient. Showed you that on the last slide. It will be too noisy, but you can do it in theory. Um, whoops, what happened here? Um, last, we update the next set of variational parameters equals the previous set plus the step size times our noisy gradient G. All right, so this is just another stochastic optimization algorithm, but we're using stochastic optimization in a different way here. We're using it to get around the fact that we can't calculate the gradient of the elbow, um, but we can calculate a noisy approximation of it. I'll let you. Any questions about the algorithm? Okay. It would be nice if it worked, but, and this is to uh, Ben's point, um, in practice, the gradient that we get, the noisy gradient, has high, two high variants. Okay, so remember, Robbins and Monroe require that the gradient be unbiased, that the expectation of the noisy gradient be equal to the real gradient, but it's going to have a mean and a variance. And if the variance is too high, if then you might walk too far in the wrong direction at first, right? If somebody has a very high variance when they point you to Johannesburg, then you're gonna, you might walk way too far and it takes you a long time to recover. And as a practical matter, that can, that can slow down convergence. And so to get this algorithm to work in practice, what we need to do is control the variance of the gradient. One way to do that is to take more samples Another way to do that are to use tricks like important sampling and control variance and route localization. <coughs> we can talk about those another time or I can, I can point you to the paper that describes all of these. But they're all methods for still maintaining the black box criteria but reducing the variance of that Monte Carlo gradient. Another way to make this work is to use adaptive step sizes to forego the Robbins-Monroe conditions and use these more modern methods like Adam and Adagrad and RMS prop. Okay. And then finally, nothing stops us here from adding further noise with by subsampling the data. Okay, if log P of X and Z is contains a term for each data point, which it probably does, and you have too many data points, you can always subsample data. That just incurs more noise on this gradient and everything still goes through. Okay, so we can we can build SVI naturally into this algorithm. All right, again, here's the deep exponential family where we iteratively generate hidden variables and then bottom out at the observations, okay? And the hidden, and the, for each observation, we have a, a stack of hidden variables and for, and for the whole data set, we have a set of weights that mediates how those hidden variables are generated. This is a totally non-conjugate model. How we got this picture with black box variational inference. Okay, so we just, you know, if you look at this graphical model, this defines how to calculate log p of z comma x, right? You just take log p of z1, log p of z2, log p of z3, and so on, all the way down to log p of x given z, and then we used variational families q to optimize. All right, but wh what's nice about black box variational inference is, as we discussed, there's lots of choices to make with deep exponential families. You can adjust the depth, you can adjust the prior that you put on the weights, you can adjust the nonlinearity that you put um, the dot product through to get the distribution of, the, of each layer. And what we did was use, we explore many different ways of building those deep exponential families. Okay, so we might have gamma representations, we might have 
Bernoulli representations, we might have Poisson representations, we have different numbers of layers, we have different ways of um, squashing the dot product to, to, to form the parameter of the hidden variable. And, you know, usually when you show a, a table like this, it's to say, oh, you know, my method did the best. But here, I'm just saying we can make a table. I mean, that's really, it, rather than each of these, each of these classes of deep exponential families requiring a graduate career length appendix in a paper, we can, we can use the same algorithm for all of these different variants where we adjusted the prior and we adjusted the number of layers and the number of components per layer and indeed the distribution of those layers, okay? It does also happen to do better than existing methods for text analysis, but the point is black box visual inference lets us easily explore a big landscape of models rather than having to write an appendix for one model. All right, and that's also how we did this neuroscience analysis that I showed you in the beginning. Right, this is also a complicated non-conjugate model because when you talk to the neuroscientists, they don't want to be constrained by conditionally conjugate models. This is a complex spatial model of neuroscience activity. Okay, and back to our Venn diagram, if we, you know, before we had an algorithm for conditionally conjugate models, and now we care, now this algorithm applies to evaluable models, meaning I can calculate log P of Z comma X. Okay, and which is a much bigger class. Now, like I said, there are models outside that class. Those are called implicit models. These are models where I can sample from them, but I can't calculate the log joint efficiently. Here, black box gradual inference works for evaluable models. Okay. So, the model was deep exponential families. We had a in new inference method, black box gradual inference. Now I want to talk about another way of doing black box variational inference, but to um, motivate that, I want to talk about still another model, okay? So this model is called Shopper. Again, we are separating the activities of modeling and inference. Shopper is a model for economists. Economists want to understand how people shop, and Shopper is a Bayesian model of consumer behavior. If you're familiar with econom econometric literature, it's a, it's a choice model. And what we can do is use Shopper to understand patterns of purchasing behavior and estimate the effects of interventions, like price. If I increase the probability of peanut butter, I'm sorry, if I increase the price of peanut butter, um, you know, how does that affect the demand for jelly? That's the kind of query we want to answer with Shopper. Now the idea in Shopper is that we're going to model people and each customer is going to walk into the store and sequentially choose items into the basket each time maximizing their utility. Okay, so this leads to a joint distribution. Uh, I think this should be X, but if the, the probability of a, of a basket of goods is the probability of picking the first item, the probability of picking the second item given the first item, all the way down to the probability of picking the last item given the previous however many items, okay? And the idea behind Shopper is that when you walk into the store, you pick each item conditional on the features of the other items that are already in your basket. All right, in other words, let's use peanut butter and jelly. Do you eat peanut butter and jelly in South Africa? Okay, what's that? Jam, yeah, when I say jelly, I mean jam, but yeah. Um, okay, so let's take peanut butter and jam as an example where, um, so if you, have, if you have jam in your basket, then um, when you're looking to pick the next item, the idea is that the features of jam make peanut butter a highly desirable item to put in your basket. All right, make sense? Are there any questions about peanut butter and jam <laughs> going together in a sandwich? What's that? Is it chunky peanut butter? Is jam chunky? Oh, jelly is disgusting. <laughs> Let's be clear. I think jam is the same in both parts of the world, but I'm not sure. Um, and I don't know if it's chunky. I don't think you should eat chunky jam. I think that's probably <laughs> bad idea. Um, where were we? Okay, good. So, so, so that it seems obvious, but that's, that's what it's like to work with economists. Um, you, you know, you want, if, if jam is in your basket, then when you decide what to pick next, you want to use the features of jam to help you decide that peanut butter is probably good to put in your basket. 
Okay, and so the features capture, for example, in my example, it's about tacos. Taco shells and beans go well together. They also could capture things like a customer doesn't need to buy four different types of salsa. Okay, so for example, let's go back to peanut butter. If I have peanut butter in my basket, I want the features of peanut butter to help me learn that the next thing I do is not put another jar of peanut butter in my basket, right? I'm not gonna pick two different peanut butters, probably. Um, or people who buy dog food also usually buy dog treats, things like that, okay? The challenge is that all these features are latent. We don't know all this stuff. All we see, our data are just people buying things, and we want to somehow learn all these features of the different items. Okay, and so what we're gonna do is build an embedding model. All right, so the conventional probability of picking item C is a log linear model. So the probability that we pick peanut butter given all the stuff in my basket is proportional to X of some value psi, where psi is a linear function of the properties of each item. So this is, this is or sorry, of a, a, a coefficient for each item. So this is a coefficient for peanut butter and the sum of the features of the other items in the basket. Okay, and what this really is, if you're familiar, this is an embedding model, okay? So this is an embedding model like word to vec or something like that. It's a probabilistic interpretation of it. Um, my favorite paper about embeddings, also from Yoshua Bengio, um, this one from 2003, uh, is, a, is called the Neural Language Model or something like that, excellent paper about embeddings. Um, we have also generalized embeddings to exponential families paper. Um, but the idea is that this is an embedding method where alpha are the latent attributes of each item, like the latent attributes of jam, and rho are the attributes that go well with each item. So rho tells me which attributes peanut butter likes to get bought with, and alpha tells me what attributes are activated when that item is in the basket. Make sense? Okay, so what's the goal? So that's, that's the basic model. Um, and what we observe is a bunch of shopping trips, X, we want to infer the posterior, the probability of alpha and rho given the shopping trip. So I observe all of us going into the supermarket and buying a basket of stuff. And what I want to know is, you know, given all of those trips, what are the latent attributes of each type of item? And what attributes does each type of item like to have in the basket with it? Okay. And this is how I got this picture I showed you in the beginning that showed you that crackers and cheese go together. Okay, so these are now taking the latent attributes of the crackers and the cheese. Actually, this is just part of the latent attribute space, which has crackers and cheese near it. And, and, and you know, we're learning that things like artichoke and spinach dip are similar um, and so on. Okay, so it, it learns these latent attributes automatically. But the problem is, as usual, shopper is we can't calculate that posterior exactly and nor is it conditionally conjugate. Okay, so nor, nor does it fit in that nice first class of models. And, but can evaluate log, the log joint, log P of alpha rho and X. And differently from other models, perhaps, we can also calculate its gradient, all right? Meaning of the log joint, this is a gradient with respect to the latent variable. Okay, so these are continuous latent variables, these embedding vectors, and we can calculate the gradient of the log joint with respect to those continuous latent variables. Clear? Just don't be confused. There's no variational family here. These are just, this is just a model. I can calculate the log joint and its gradient. All right, and so when you're in the class of models where you can calculate the log joint and its gradient, then you can use Fox variational inference with a different gradient, the reparameterization gradient. Okay, so here's the way the reparameterization gradient works. Again, I know Shakir covered this, but if you, you know, hear it twice, you learn it twice as well. Um, suppose that you can calculate log P of z, X and Z, sorry, suppose log P of X and Z and log Q of Z are differentiable with respect to Z, all right? So the log variational distribution and the log joint have to be differentiable with respect to the latent variables. That's just a version of what I just said here for this particular model, okay? That's the first thing. Two, we need the variational distribution to be able to, to, to we need to be able to write it with a transformation. Okay, and so, for example, what that means in notation is that I want to draw some kind of, we call it a noise variable, a noise variable epsilon from some fixed distribution S. Then I want to set Z equal to some function of the noise variable and my variational parameters. And when I do that, what that implies is that Z comes from Q. Okay? 
So the simplest and most widely used example of this transformation is this one. You draw epsilon from a standard normal. You set z equal to epsilon times sigma plus mu. And what that means, if you go through that little process, is that z comes from a normal with mu and variance sigma squared. Okay? Notice where the variational parameters live. They are part of the transformation. Okay? So the variational parameters here, sigma and mu, are part of the function t as opposed to part of something that we're, that we're sampling from. And that's going to be important. That's the kind of key idea behind reparameterization gradients. Okay, so the variational parameters are not part of the noise distribution. That's fixed, but they're part of the transformation, what I do to the noise to get a variable that's drawn from Q. Here are the differentiable models. All right, this is not to scale, just to be clear. I don't know how big this class is. But the point is, all differentiable models are valuable, but not all evaluable models are differentiable. Some differentiable models are also conditionally conjugate, but there are conditionally conjugate models that are not differentiable, because conditionally models can contain discrete random variables. All right, but this is still a, another class of models. Okay, so here is the reparameterization gradient. Again, I'm ca I'm, I'm, again, my goal in black box variational inference is to calculate the gradient with respect to the elbow and to construe it as an expectation so that I can then take Monte Carlo estimates of it and use stochastic optimization. And so here, the gradient with respect to the variational parameters of the elbow is an expectation with respect to the noise distribution of the gradient of the instantaneous elbow with respect to z. Okay, so here's the instantaneous elbow again. Remember, it's the elbow evaluated at a particular value, value of the hidden variables. But now I'm taking the gradient of that with respect to the hidden variables times the gradient of the transformation with respect to the variational parameters. Remember, that's where the variational parameters appear. All right, but it's a little confusing perhaps, and it'll be clear in the algorithm. Remember, z itself is a, is t of epsilon comma nu is what z is. That's z. Okay, but anyway, that, this is the reparameterization gradient. Okay, and this plays nicely also with auto differentiation. Okay, so auto differentiation, especially with respect to the model, um, makes the reparameterization gradient quite attractive because what it means is that I could specify the model, log p of x comma z, and then rely on automatic differentiation to provide for me the gradient with respect to the hidden variables. And so then it kind of reduces to the, to a, Anyway, I don't have to take gradients. I don't need to write an appendix that has the gradient of the log joint. All right? And also, we can use and reuse different transformations. Okay? And so there's a lot of papers recently about different ways of transforming variables to get good cues, and we can use and reuse those transformations because that's part of the variational family, not part of the model. Okay, so let's go through this, and then um, I, I'll take your questions about the reparameterization DBVI. Again, the input is the data and the model. Again, we initialize the variational parameters randomly and set the step size appropriately. And again, we're going to iterate. Okay? So first, we're going to take S samples from the auxiliary variable. All right? So the first thing I'm going to do is draw a bunch of standard normals. Then I'm going to use those to calculate the noisy gradient of the um, of the elbow. Okay, so uh, I'm going to evaluate the gradient of the instantaneous elbow at t of epsilon s nu n. Nu n. I guess n is the iteration. All right, so I'm going to I'm going to evaluate that gradient at my the the realized z that I get from these epsilons, and then I'm going to evaluate the gradient at those epsilons of the transformation. Okay, so this is a Monte Carlo estimate of the reparameterization gradient. And then I'm going to update the variational parameters as before. T plus 1 equals new T plus rho T times this noisy gradient. Okay? Is this clear? This is the Monte Carlo stochastic optimization algorithm using the reparameterization gradient. And it's really the same algorithm as before, just I've changed the way I construe the gradient of the elbow as an expectation. Any questions?
And this is how I got this picture. And this is also the key idea behind using variational inference in probabilistic programming. So I, I don't have time to talk in too much depth about probabilistic programming, but probabilistic programming is one of the main motivators for black box variational inference. The idea behind probabilistic programming is that, you know, we've been talking about these probability models almost like they're programs. Generate Z, generate Z2, generate Z3, then generate the observations, right? It's a program. And in probabilistic programming, what you do is you, like Stan is an example of a probabilistic programming system, you write down your probability model as a program, like in, in a syntax that almost looks like C or something, and then um, rather than compiling that program into an executable that runs the program, you compile that program into an executable that takes data and spits out approximate posteriors, okay? But in order to make that nice vision a reality, you need an inference method that you can derive from a program. And these black box inference methods are such methods, right? If you, if the program specifies the log joint, then you could use automatic differentiation to get the gradient of the log joint and somehow write a compiler that produces this algorithm. Okay, that's the idea. Okay, and so this is an example of analyzing uh, millions of taxi trajectories with a complicated probabilistic model that we wrote in this probabilistic programming language, STAN. And STAN implements a, a black box variational inference method. And, and many other probabilistic programming systems do as well too. Okay, so those are the two main ways. Yeah, question. Which slide? Ah, good. Okay, yeah. So let's talk about the difference between them. So when to use which one? It's a natural question. So here's the score gradient. Here's the reparameterization gradient. Again, both of these are gradients of the elbow that are written down as expectations. So I can use Monte Carlo approximation and stochastic optimization. And what's the difference? Well, the score gradient, it's got a wider apl ap applicability, as that Venn diagram shows. It works for discrete and continuous models, and it works for a large class of variational approximations. But as I mentioned, the variance of the noisy gradient can be large, right? To get it to work, you need things like control variates and important sampling and Rab localization and so on. Okay, we still do all those things inside of the black box criteria, but it's a bit of work. Now, the reparameterization gradient requires differentiable models, so we can't use discrete variables. Um, it requires variational approximation to be transformable, but it has a better behaved variance. I should also say it's computationally more expensive because usually if you have to calculate the gradient of the log joint as well as the log joint itself, that costs more than just evaluating the log joint. Okay, um, and you know, in this, uh, we have a review paper about variational inference and um, did a little analysis just with a toy model of the variance of the, of the um, gradient and we see what I just described for you. That, that here the blue line is the score gradient. It has higher variance than the other two. The red line is the reparameterization gradient and the blue line is the score gradient adding some of these tricks to reduce its variance. Okay, it doesn't get as low as the red line but it's better than the score gradient without those tricks. That said, you know, my suspicion um, is, and especially with talking to some colleagues, is that you know, a lot of times you want to think about that computational angle, that like it might be that I know that the, the, the reparameterization gradient has nicer variance. That said, since I can more cheaply use the score gradient with more samples, that might offset the advantages that I have from the reparameterization gradient. So it's, a, it's an empirical question, probably case by case. Okay, again, models that can use the score gradient are evaluable models. Models that can use the reparameterization gradient are differentiable models. All right, I'm gonna get some more water. We're gonna pause. How much time is left, Ben, do you know? 25 minutes, okay. Okay, so at this point I wanna pop up like 100,000 feet to just look again at the big picture and discuss what we've covered and then we're gonna get back into some more details. Um, so remember this picture. We have our knowledge of the world and a question we wanna answer. We use it to form a model, Schopper, DEFs, LDA, whatever. We then take our data and our model and we 
infer the posterior, and then we use that posterior to do something, text analysis or econometric counterfactual analysis or whatever it is we're doing. The key algorithmic problem, which we've been discussing in these two lectures, is posterior inference. How do I infer the hidden variables given the observations, given my data? Now, variational inference, we talked about the basics, but then we talked about these two innovations that generalize to many models and scale up to large data sets. Okay, and so the point, again, is to lubricate this pipeline so that we can easily run through it without having to do a lot of difficult mathematical work. One second. Um, and, you know, if you remember one thing from these lectures, both of these innovations rely on stochastic optimization, somehow using noisy gradients to solve the inference problem through optimization. SVI forms noisy gradients by subsampling data, and BBVI forms noisy gradients with Monte Carlo. Also, both BBVI can use automatic differentiation. Um, and so, whereas the basics of variational inference, you know, were in place however many years ago, these, these innovations, SVI and BBVI, which came out of a number of researchers over the last five, six years, they have really changed what's possible with large-scale probabilistic modeling. What's your question? Yeah. So the, is, let me repeat the question, make sure I understand. You're saying if I'm in the um, class of models that's conditionally conjugate and differentiable, do I lose something by using the reparameterization gradient? Yeah. I don't know the answer. I suspect yes. So, you know, I suspect that the coordinate updates, or SVI, with the complete conditionals is going to do well because, you know, this is my intuition, because you're doing more work to get the algorithm. <laughs> Somehow, you get what you pay for. Um, that said, I think it's a cool open research problem to think about either automatically, you know, there is hope to automatically um, derive those complete conditionals. So to be clear, those complete conditionals are a specific calculation, right? You don't have to write a big appendix, but you have to sit down in your house with a piece of paper and figure out what the complete conditionals are for each vi latent variable. That said, there's hope that this could be maybe made automatic. And so I know Dustin Tran and Matt Hoffman and others have a recent paper about doing that. Um, two, saving if you want to save all that time with the reparameterization gradient, maybe there are other automatic tricks with the re within reparameterization gradients that would then offset whatever benefits you got. So I think it's, it's kind of an interesting open question. Yeah. Yeah. I see. So you're saying that, well, okay. Okay. So I guess I, I, I would want to know what you mean by overfitting the posterior. So this is the situation we're usually in, where we have a simpler family than the posterior is, and so I'm not, ch and, 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 we're ch and we're trying to get closest to that posterior. So in this picture, is there a notion of overfitting the posterior? That's the next subject, yeah. Yep. Are you asking about KL collapse, maybe? Okay. So, we'll, let's talk about variational autoencoders next. That's the next subject that I wanted to discuss. Um, 
so far we have this picture, and here I, I guess I don't know what it would mean to overfit the posterior. The posterior, we're, we are fitting the posterior in the sense that we're trying to get close to the posterior. I don't quite know what it would mean to overfit the posterior, because we can either be close or far. You know what I mean? Yeah. An estimate of what? Of the elbow? Ah, well, to be clear, that's the beauty of stochastic optimization. So the lower bound, it's a lower bound for any setting of Q. So you have no risk that your Q is going to lead to an elbow that's not in lower bound. Now, maybe you can't calculate that elbow. That's a different story. But no, there is no risk that any elbow is not going to, that, uh, that a Q is going to lead to an elbow that's not a lower bound. It is always preserved. Now, if you optimize an approximation to the elbow, well, there's still no risk that you're going to get a Q that does not, in, a, in the true elbow, lead to a lower bound, but you might not get an optimal Q. It might not be even a local optimum. That is a risk. That said, I've heard in practice it works pretty well. Take a Taylor approximation to the elbow and optimize, and you know, that, can, that can do good things. And there's a nice paper. The paper that introduced the, the nomenclature elbow works with delta methods um, of the elbow and it works well. So I'm not going to have enough time to go through all of this, but you know, we now have the basics and I want to talk about a few more advanced ideas. And the first one is what you mentioned, Nico, which is the variational autoencoder. And then maybe we can revisit the overfitting question once we know what a variational autoencoder is. Um, secondly, we can derive VBVI. I don't think I have time to do both. And so um, uh, let, let's do the first one. And then um, if you're interested, we can maybe talk about how to derive VBVI uh, during the questions. Um, and then I want to summarize by talking a little bit about open, about research in variational inference. Okay, so these are slides I made recently, like in the last couple days. What is a variational autoencoder? How many of you have heard of the variational autoencoder? Good, so it's most of you. So again, we need a model. And for variational autoencoder, the model is it's called a deep generative model, okay? A deep generative model, um, which comes from some of Shakir's work, is essentially nonlinear probabilistic PCA. Okay, that's one way to think about it, all right? I, I, it's a model of local variables, so I draw my local variable Z from a standard normal, and then Z goes through some kind of neural network to obtain the mean of the data point, okay? So I drew it in a picture like this, where I draw Z from some kind of fixed distribution, and then Z is input to a, a neural network that produces mu i, and then xi comes from a Gaussian with mean mu i, okay? Often Z can produce mu i and sigma i, but let's just have it produce mu i for, for today, okay? Is this clear? So in PCA, I draw Z from a normal, and then I take an inner product with some coefficients, and that gives me the mean of my observed data point. Here I draw Z from a normal. I put it through a complicated neural network that is some kind of nonlinear relationship to weights, and that gives me the mean of the, of the data. Okay, the same idea, it, but this is a nonlinear representation. Clear? So this is a deep generative model. All right. F of zi is a neural network with parameters theta and input zi. And the model is sometimes called the decoder, okay? But I like to call it the model, okay? And it, it, it represents the joint distribution of zi and xi given parameters theta, okay? But I mention the decoder because when you read in the literature, there are some interesting papers, but they don't use the word model. They use the word decoder. So what's the deal with this model? Well. Let's say we fix the global parameters theta for now. And I want to infer for a particular data point the local variable zi. All right, so I want to calculate p of zi given xi and theta. And as usual, that equals the joint divided by the margin. And we can't do it as usual because of the denominator. But notice this is at the local level. Just for a particular data point, I can't calculate p of zi given xi and theta because I can't calculate this denominator because this likelihood, p of xi given zi prime and theta, that contains this complex neural network and I can't integrate through it. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to do variational inference for zi. And we're going to use variational inference at the local level, aiming to fit a q of zi that is close to the posterior. Now, one idea in variational autoencoder literature is the idea of amortization. All right, so remember, we're talking about local inference, and um, we have, like, let's say we have 100 data points. We have 100 little posterior inference problems, right? We want q of z1, q of z2, q of z3, all the way up to q of z100. And the idea of amortization is that the variational family, so in, cl in classical mean field, what would we do? We would say each q has its own parameter. Right? Q of Z1 comes from parameter phi1. Q of Z2 has parameter phi2, and so on, all the way up to Q of Z100. But in amortized variational inference, what we do is Q of Zi depends on some parameter, shared variational parameter nu, and the ith data point. Okay? So this is a third place in the talk where if you're a statistician, you'll think it's crazy. If I'm trying to estimate something, how can I use xi in that estimation? It seems wrong, but it's okay because I'm trying to estimate the posterior and the posterior does depend on xi. And so I can use xi in my approximation of the posterior too. Okay, so, but to be clear, notice how this is different from the classical approach the cl to variational inference. In the classical approach, this would have a free parameter nu i. In this approach, it has a shared parameter that all of the variational approximations use, but each one uses that maybe in a different way through xi. All right? And this is called amortization. So, for example, in variational autoencoding literature, Q of Zi, given Xi and nu, is a normal distribution whose mean is G of Xi with parameter nu, where G is another neural network. Okay, so this is separate from the model. Here's the model. That's the model. And please remember this. There are two objects at play in variational autoencoder. There's a model. This is a model. And there's a variational family. This is a variational family. They're separate. They're different things. The model is the model. You could change the model. This is a variational family. You could change that too. Or you could use that on a different model. They're not necessarily tied together. I mean, they're, they're going to be in the objective, but they're not necessarily tied together conceptually, right? This is where I think my data came from. This is the thing I want to use to approximate my local posterior. Okay, and so what Q is going to be is it's going to be a normal distribution whose mean is a neural network which takes the data as input and spits out some mean. And um, we call that neural network the inference network. Okay, it has shared parameters nu and input xi. Clear? Okay, so whereas before every variational parameter was different, here to get the variational parameter for data point five, I stick data point five through the inference network, get out a mean, and that's the variational mean for date for Z5. To get the variational parameter for Z98, I take the X98, the data point of the 98th data point, I put it through the same inference network and I get out the variational mean for Z98. Clear? They, they share new, but they're different in terms of what's input to the inference network. Now, when you do amortized inference, you tie together the elbow for each ZI. So here is the elbow for one ZI, but now the elbow for each ZI uses the same variational parameters new. So the objective function is a function of these variational parameters nu. It's a sum over the data of the elbow, each individualized elbow. These elbows are expectations with respect to the Q, the amortized Q, that take in the ith data point and use the shared variational parameters. Clear? So if you wanted to calculate this, you would march through the data and calculate the variational mean for each data point and then take this expectation with each data point. Okay, but that variational mean, all of those variational means would depend on new. So amortization is about learning to infer. You're learning these news that help you do inference on all of your data points at, at the same time. And personally, I think there's more to this story. This works well. I don't think we're sure why. 
And there are a lot of interesting connections to ideas and statistics like empirical Bayes and hierarchical modeling, but this is all open research. Okay, but we can still describe what a variational autoencoder is. So now, we've got a differentiable model and we've got an objective function, so we're gonna use the reparameterization gradient. Okay, but it looks a tiny bit, it's, it's the same idea, but it, it, it's, there's, a, there's a nuance because we're doing amortized inference. The transformation, the Q transformation looks like this. I draw epsilon from a standard normal as usual, and now my transformation depends both on the variational parameters nu, but also on xi, right? Because remember, the, the transformation depends on the variational parameters and whatever it is I use to construct Q, and so the transformation uh, is epsilon plus G of xi with parameter nu. Okay, that's how I transform my variational family. Okay, now I can write down the reparameterization gradient just as before, and I can calculate this gradient with Monte Carlo. And what's nice about this is that all the gradients involved here of the log likelihood, like the gradient of log p of x given z and theta, the gradient of q, they all involve standard neural net calculations, basically backprop or evaluating the neural net. Um, and so you can do this all inside things like TensorFlow or PyTorch or whatever it is. Okay, so that's, so we can fit the variational parameters with the reparameterization gradient in this amortized objective. Now, what about the model? Remember, here's the variational distribution, here's the model. There's two things at play. Well, the elbow, as we've been talking about, is also a bound on the log like Okay, so one thing I can do is fit the model following its gradient with respect to theta. Okay, and so if I take this objective function here on the pre, oops, sorry, here on the previous slide, I take this objective function, but only look at the terms that depend on theta, the model parameters, I just get the log likelihood, the expected log likelihood. Okay, and so fitting theta to this expected log likelihood is like fitting the model parameters. It's a proxy for fitting the model parameters. It's a bound, but it's, it's pretty good. This is called variational EM when you do this. And again, remember, Z is the transformed C. Okay, so to answer the question, what is a VAE? The VAE simultaneously optimizes the variational family nu and the model parameters theta. That's what a VAE does. It samples epsilon for each data point, calculates its, its current estimate of its latent variable. It uses those samples to calculate noisy gradients with respect to nu and theta, and then it follows those gradients in a stochastic optimization. Thanks. So it fits perfectly into this BBVI framework that we've set up. Now, when VAEs are implemented, they're often implemented as a stochastic computation graph of the MC approximation of the elbow, and then automatic differentiation, backpropagation takes care of the rest. But this is what is happening. There are two things. I don't like to rant. But I will. <laughs> Things have gotten blurry with variational autoencoders where, you know, I made these slides because this semester uh, students would come into my office and they'd say, oh, what do you want to work on for your final project? And they'd say, I want to stick a variational autoencoder into this, or I want to put a variational autoencoder on that, or I want to make a jacket and put a variational autoencoder in it. And it doesn't make sense to me because, as you know, I'm, uh, you know, quite committed to the separation of inference and modeling. And so when you stick a variational autoencoder onto something, and a variational autoencoder really means that there are two things at play, an inference network and a model, then I can't parse that sentence. And so, um, yeah, I wanted to make that clear in this talk, that there really are two ideas at play in variational autoencoding. One is the generative model, and the other is amortized inference. Now it's true that if you implement this, you can, you, they all get tied together in the elbow, and that's what a variational autoencoder essentially is. It's the stochastic computation graph of that approximation of the elbow. But from the machine learning and statistics perspective, what you're doing is fitting this model with amortized inference. And so, you know, here's the algorithm that happens when you, when you write that stochastic computation graph. 
Again, the input is the data X and I guess the architectures of these neural nets that you need. And you're going to initialize your variational parameters randomly and set your step size appropriately. Again, you're going to iterate. Now, what are we going to do? First, for each data point, I'm going to choose a noise variable from this distribution and then I'm going to set the corresponding latent variable ZI. Okay, so I go through my whole data set and I, and I, and I draw an epsilon for each data point and then I set what I think that its latent variable would be given that epsilon, right? That, that's a transformation that involves, oops, sorry, that involves XI and the, the variational parameters nu. Then I'm going to use these epsilons and Zs to, to calculate these noisy gradients, right? Here's the re noisy reparameterization gradient, the Monte Carlo approximation. Here is the um, Monte Carlo approximation of the uh, gradient of the log likelihood. And notice that they're using the same epsilons, right? That's the idea. Finally, I'm going to update both the variational parameters and the model parameters with those noisy gradients. Okay, and so that's a variational autoencoder. That's how variational autoencoders fit a deep generative model. Okay. Let me do it. Let me, um, I don't know how to do this. I'm going to just flip through the slides. I don't like to do that, but I'm going to skip this section. You can ask me about it later because it, there's not a much, much time. Okay, so close your eyes. This is good stuff. <laughs> it all would have become much more clear for you after that. Okay, good. So that was exciting. We just arrived BBVI. Um, so I want to conclude by just, as I promised, asking you to stare at that picture that uh, Shakir and Rajesh and I drew a few years ago and um, show you that that picture kind of embodies lots of research of variational inference and helps you organize when you're organize your thinking when you're reading papers about variational inference. All right, so again, probabilistic machine learning is about connecting our domain knowledge to data and it gives us a computational methodology for scalable modeling and our goal is to make it expressive, scalable and easy to develop. And perhaps you saw that we're trying hard at that goal in this talk that, you know, we thought about how to make it scalable we thought about how to make it expressive, meaning to expand the classes of models that we can do things with, and we thought about how to make it easy to develop in the sense of doing probabilistic programming. Okay, again, posterior inference is the key algorithmic problem. And again, we showed how to scale it up and how to generalize variational inference. All right, so here's just a list to remind you of all the things we talked about. Mean field variational inference, coordinate descent optimization, stochastic variational inference, different ways of doing black box variational inference. And then along the way, we talked about these four models, LDA, deep exponential families, embedding models, and deep generative models, and kind of use those models as um, examples and motivators for developing these different algorithms. Okay, but of course the point is I want you to make your own models up and then try these algorithms out on the models that work for the problems you care about. Okay, so as I said, this picture kind of identifies all the ingredients of variational inference algorithms. So first, we can ask, what about the class of models, okay? And so when we started the talk, we talked about conditionally conjugate models. Um, but we can ask, what if they aren't conditionally conjugate, but we can differentiate the log likelihood, right? Those are differentiable models. Um, or we can ask, what if we can't differentiate the log likelihood, but we can calculate the log likelihood? Those are evaluable models. And as I mentioned, we can actually ask, what if we can't even evaluate the log likelihood, but we can sample from the model? Okay, so a lot of models in like climate science and, and physics and, um, and uh, other sciences like that are these models where over the years, researchers build complicated simulators, say of the universe, and these are random, they, they, they contain random variables, Nobody could write down the log joint of these random variables, but they can push go on the Fortran code and get a sample from the simulator, okay? And so what they might want to do then is try to estimate the constants that govern the simulation, say, of the universe. If you talk to a physicist, you know, physicists like to tell me anyway that there are seven constants that govern the whole universe. 
okay? And so, um, right, imagine you have a physics simulator where the seven constants go in and then it simulates the universe for you and you wanna now take your observations of the universe and figure out what those constants are. That's, a, that's called an implicit model and that's, a, and that's an implicit model inference problem and we're starting to work on that. How to do variational inference in those settings. Okay, so that's the model class. That's P of Z given X. Now, what about the family of variational approximations? Well, we talked about mean field approximations completely today. Um, but going beyond the mean field, there is structured variational inference. Okay, so that is where there is, um, where the latent variables aren't totally independent in the variational family. And so it's a more expressive variational family. It's more expensive to optimize, but it's more, you can get higher fidelity to the posterior. Um, variational models are an interesting line of work. That's where the, um, there are dependencies between the, the latent variable, between the hidden variables in the variational family, but there are also per variational distribution hidden variables. So you can imagine a variational distribution that is itself a mixture. Okay, this was pioneered by Neil Lawrence, who you'll hear from later um, in his PhD thesis. And recently we've also worked on ways of, of using that in, in the context of black box variational inference. Again, this expands the, this, this expands the ellipse of the family of distributions so that it hopefully can get closer to P of Z given X. Sequential Monte Carlo is another way of doing that. And then we talked a bit about amortized inference, which is kind of a, a weird, in this picture, it's sort of a weird um, idea. It's like saying, you know, I'm gonna stick with mean field maybe, but I'm gonna carve out some complicated shape in this ellipse based on the data. And then I'm gonna optimize within that family. All right, uh, several of you asked about alternatives to the KL divergence. So today we only worked with KLQP. Um, but there are many ways to change the metric by which you measure closeness between the variational approximation and the exact posterior. All right, so early work on expectation propagation and belief propagation uh, can be about, it, it can be interpreted as changing the metric, being, these being variational methods broadly defined, where we change the metric of how we measure closeness. Okay, expectation propagation approximates KLPQ, for example, and that has some, some nice properties. It also has some not nice properties. Um, belief propagation, I forgot the name of the divergence, but it's a divergence from statistical physics. And then um, th some examples of papers from our work on this are operator variational inference, where you can use operators to define new distance metrics, and chi variational inference, where you use the chi divergence. And, and this is a choice that is a, it's a matter of taste or a matter of what's important in your problem where these different divergences, none is perfect um, and each comes with some properties that are good and some properties that you might not want and it depends on what properties are important for the problem at hand. One advantage of KLQP, you know, I've found research in this to be fun but sometimes frustrating in that KLQP often works really well on large scale problems despite all of its deficiencies. And one thing that's nice about KLQP is that it's computationally very tractable. That's the whole point of KLQP. That's why we work with KLQP in the first place. Um, so I only recommend moving to more exotic divergences if you think that there is a problem with your inference and you think the problem has to do with KLQP. Okay, last and perhaps most interesting, you know, the whole point of variational inference, what we say variational inference means, is that it's about turning a problem that you're trying to calculate into an optimization problem. And one thing that's nice about variational inference is that now the whole world of optimization is open to you to help you do your, solve your posterior inference problem. And so there's been a lot of work on, and, and these two lectures were about, for example, stochastic optimization as one way to, um, to uh, do better variational inference. And looking at the whole world of stochastic optimization and optimization in general, and asking when can I use results from that world in the context of variational inference connects these two fields of optimization and, and Bayesian statistics and probabilistic calculations. And so some examples of work on this are things like proximity variational inference where you bound how far away you go from a place, um, thinking about stochastic gradient descent itself as a variational inference algorithm where the, where the probabilistic properties of the SGD algorithm that you run can be manipulated so that it's 
stationary distribution is an approximation to the posterior. And of course, there's many, many papers and, and a lot of work on doing things like having a good learning rate and averaging the gradients and using bias gradients, but still getting to a good answer and so on. So there's this whole basically world and research literature that's ready to connect to Bayesian statistics through variational inference. Okay, and so that one picture then kind of tells you how, you know, you can look at a paper about variational inference and ask, okay, where does it fit into this picture? Um, or thinking about what you might want to work on. Um, and speaking of what you might want to work on, there's lots of great open problems in variational inference. And I'm not going to list them, but here are some categories. Um, first, theory. So if you're familiar with MCMC, you know that many, many PhD theses and books and papers and ink has been spilled on the theory of MCMC, but comparatively less has been used for variational inference. And there's lots of great open theoretical questions. You know, your question about overfitting probably fits into this category about, you know, as an estimator, what is variational inference doing? And can I prove any guarantees about how close I'm going to get to the exact posterior and so on? With MCMC, we know that we've defined a chain whose stationary distribution is the exact posterior we care about. And so the theory does things like prove how fast we converge to that stationary distribution. But what about variational inference? So I encourage you to look at theory. Optimization, as we mentioned, you know, how do I use results from optimization and variational inference? Alternative divergences, we mentioned, are alternative divergences useful? Can we, um, can we make them computationally tractable? Can we combine divergences? So on. Um, and what about better approximations? So are there ways to improve variational inference in terms of the fidelity of its approximation to the exact posterior? Okay, so these are all kind of broad, open research questions inside variational inference, in addition to the usual research questions of, here's a new model, can I do variational inference in it, and what are its properties? All right, so here's some references. These are from my group um, about some of the things we talked about today. Um, and then that's the end, that's my last slide. <laughs> Thanks very much. Other time for questions? Okay. Anybody have a question? Yeah. There's three questions. We'll take three. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Great. It shouldn't have had that. Let me go back through all these slides. Um, the epsilon should have been inside G. Yeah, but I might have made a mistake. Here we go. Ah, no, I didn't make a mistake. Correct. This is correct. So. Um, the mean, so what is the variation, in plain English, what is the, what, is the tr what is the variational distribution in a variational autoencoder? It says, I take the data point, I, it dances through a neural network, leads, a, leads me to a mean, and that's the mean of my variational distribution, okay? And it's got variance one in this simple example. And so how do I, how do I get a Gaussian with variance one and that has that mean? I draw a standard Gaussian, I add that mean to the standard Gaussian, that's it. Yeah, so in real variational autoencoders where, where G actually produces the mean and the variance, then this is multiplied by the second component of the output of G. Yeah. Good. There are two more questions. Yeah, that's a good question. I imagine the answer is yes. I don't know how to do it, but I think that that, you know, that kind of 
speaks to the let's think more carefully about optimization and stochastic optimization, right? Sampling, in other words, if I can rephrase your question, sampling uniformly at random each time seems silly. Like maybe I want to get a representative sample. Like I, if I sampled a document all about cats last time, you know, to sample another document about cats wouldn't really help me, but sampling a document about dogs, that's going to push the topics in a new direction. So how can I adaptively sample? Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. And, and, and hopefully you can see like that fits really in, well into the how can I improve the optimization procedure in a smart way. And so looking at mini batch sampling and things like that in the optimization literature and maybe contributing to that, but then applying it here, it's a great idea. Yeah, there was a third question. Yes. Yes. So um, variational inference underestimates the posterior variance. <laughs> uh, this is a fact, and um, mean field variational inference especially. Um, and uh, so if your downstream application requires that you know the posterior variance for whatever reason, for example, maybe you're doing Thompson sampling or something, um, then that could be a problem. You know, things like structured variational inference and uh, vari hierarchical variational models, these help mitigate this issue. Um, Tamara Broderick has some really nice work with Ryan Giordano on like post hoc adjusting the variational approximation to better capture the posterior variance. Um, but yeah, this is one of the, you know, what you, what you get from the improved speed Ver over MCMC with large scale, you lose in terms of posterior variance estimation. Now it doesn't matter for a lot of the applications that I look at because we look at posterior expectations generally at the end, but to the degree that you, you might care about posterior variance, this is going to give you an underestimate. Okay, thanks very much.